We're talking all about control cables today. Hey everybody, Scott Daly here from Carl Stahl Sava Industries, and today we're talking about control cables or push-pull uh, cable assemblies with uh, design engineer Kyle Bartosik. Welcome, Kyle. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good. It's great to have Kyle today because I've never spoken with him in this format, and I'm super excited to do it with you. So before we dive into control cables, let's just hear a little bit about your audience knows nothing about you yet, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, you've written some blogs with us, but tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've been here at Sava Industries for nearly a decade now. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, I had attended uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, where I studied uh, aerospace engineering. And that you studied aerospace engineering is that an indication of a love of yours? Do you are you are, are you do you have a love of the science of flight? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, planes to me are they're they're an engineering marvel. Uh, everything is so precisely designed and, mm -hmm. and calculated, but really. It still feels like magic that this metal tube can seemingly defy gravity and, and fly in the sky. I love flying too, but I, I don't I don't analyze flight as you just described it, but I sure do love being in the air. It is it is quite something. It, it really is. Wonderful. It is a miracle. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into control cables. Um, so let's start with the the simplest question, which is what is a control cable? Uh, a control cable really simply is is just a, a, a cable assembly that transmits motion, force and motion, uh, from point A to point B. Uh, whether that point B is 5 feet away, 15 feet away, mm -hmm. or 50 feet away, it doesn't matter. And give us some examples of push-pull or control cables that we could get our heads around. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I would say a, a very common application or a very common example of a control cable assembly is in your lawnmower. Uh, there's a, a cable assembly that runs from the choke that you're always using to just turn on and off mm -hmm. the uh, the thing all the way down to the carburetor that controls the airflow uh, of the engine. Sure. Uh, another example I would say, oh, is in, in your bicycle. Um, in the handlebars of your of your bike, um, that there's a control cable assembly. It runs from your brakes, the handlebar brakes, all mm -hmm. the way down to the actual disc brakes to use and to allow you to stop. Sure. Uh, if we're going to more advanced cases, uh, I would say uh, ejection seats is is another good one in planes or, or maybe in helicopters, really. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, hopefully you never need a, a, to use an ejection seat, mm -hmm. but uh, in the times that you need to, the, there, there's a control cable assembly there. And what's interesting to me is that when we say control cables, it's actually uh, not entirely an accurate representation of what we're talking about because it's actually an assembly. There's multiple components that comprise a, a control cable. Can you talk about a little bit what about the parts that comprise a control cable? Yeah, uh, so there's a, a handful of components to, to a, a control cable. Uh, you start out with the core wire or cable. Uh, you have the casing that, that it runs through and uh, uh, two or more fittings on, on the ends. And uh, when you've got this assembly fully ready for the customer, what are some of the decisions that went into that? Because I imagine that not there are no two cable uh, push-pull or control cables that are identical, right? So what are some of the considerations that you apply as a designer of these assemblies? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You, you do have some... Um some uh, pros and cons to, to mm -hmm. each one. I would and isn't it also true as an engineer, I'm sorry to interrupt no, you, yeah. that there's often, as a designer, an engineer uh, of these products, that there's a bit of give and take, right? Yes. Like you have to make, and your co your customer, who you're collaborating with, they know that too, right? Like there's, you can, you, you're telling them you can have these three things, but it's going to come at the risk of one of these. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, uh, always give and takes uh, with these things. Uh, I would say some of the biggest give and takes is, uh, first, I would actually... First, you have to determine whether it's going to be a, a pull application mm -hmm. or a push application. That, okay. That's going to be your, your first uh, give and take. Uh, because in a push application, uh, you typically use something, uh, you, a solid core wire or a stiff cable construction like a 1x7. Um, that allows you to um, impart a uh, that force back and forth. Uh, think about the uh, 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 lawnmower. Sure. Right? Yeah. So in, in the choke, it is going in both directions. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in something that's like a, uh, a more flexible cable, uh, it's going to buckle um, if you don't have that uh, solid core to really back up. But like, uh, imagine like, it's a solid rod. Sure. You know, you're, you're going to be able to push something harder with a solid rod than you are with something that's flexible and like a noodle. Right, right. But, but conversely, in a pull application, you want that um, flexible cable. Something like a 7x7 seven seven works. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, because it allows you to have a higher tensile strength than you did in the uh, push application with the solid core. Uh, the bicycle brakes, for instance, if you had a solid wire that was you were trying to break with a solid mm-hmm. wire, mm-hmm. that is going to snap and break way sooner than you are going to with a uh, cable itself. And you really want to stop on a brake, and you don't want yeah, the brakes to sure fail. Do. Yeah. So your concern is not necessarily with with its behaviors inside the interior walls of the conduit, but when it emerges outside the conduit, you're concerned about whether or not it buckles there, it kinks or twists or bends there. Yeah, absolutely. So that leads me actually nicely into my next question, which is the conduit. Um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the importance of it, the significance of it? Uh, yeah, so the, the conduit really is important because, uh, I mean, first off, think about it as like the, the highway that the core or inner cable drives on, sure, yeah. right? Uh, the, the conduit allows you to route your, your cable or route your system uh, all the way through without the need of like links or pulleys. Um, it, it also, what it does is it prevents the buckling of the cable. So so as it's running through, it's constantly being redirected mm-hmm. uh, to, to your point Yeah, I think point of a bike, B. right? With the brakes, for example, that's twisting and turning before it finds its way to the caliber for it, the brakes. Exactly. It's it's not just a straight line. Caliber, it's, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. But it, it's not just a straight line. It's it's going all the way around to make sure that you can, you know, break. <laughs> right. Um, it, it also provides something very important. I mean, even in the brakes example, um, it, it prevents... Uh, particulates from getting inside and, and gunking up the the system. Mm-hmm. I, if you if you had things that got inside, you, you would now would take so much more force to actually generate to get it to that same, same because function. because particulate as you put it, um, unwanted artifact inside the interior walls of that conduit can be a progressive problem. Yes. So when you say it can get harder to actuate this push or pull motion, it's because as alien you know material get comes in contact with the inside it can start to fight with the cable is that what you mean exactly exactly so is the inside of the cable lubricated to allow for the smooth transition of the cable actually no it's it's the complete opposite it is not lubricated on purpose you you only want to use something like a, a pfte or teflon some sort of mm-hmm. lining plastic lining if you use lubricants the lubricants tend to pick up the the debris pick up these like small little parts and gunk up the system so, oh, that's interesting. So if we were to lubricate the interior walls, it would act as gravity for material you don't want introduced to the inside of the exactly, conduit. Exactly. And so because this is obviously, it's, I mean, to hear you tell it, no two um, uh, push-pull assemblies or control cables are the same. So if that's the case, then what is your advice for engineers who are designing or handing you a drawing for a control cable? What is your recommendations to them? Yeah, uh, I, I exactly as you said, there, there really is no one-size-fits-all solution for mm-hmm. control cable assemblies. It really is highly customizable. I, I really would encourage a collaborative effort with the uh, engineers to ensure that we can finalize and ensure that you can get the correct design in your system. <laughs> I've seen it oh, way too many times. I've seen it firsthand where... On paper, it, it's a perfect design. Mm-hmm. It, it works in testing over here, and whatnot. Right. But the engineers didn't take into consideration how the uh, control cable would actually be installed in their system, whether it's how it would actually get routed or how would the casing would be secured. Uh, these really are important factors to consider when. when Is designing. it also well? Okay, so that thank you. Uh, so last question, yeah. promise. Um, great conversation, by the way. Thank you. Um, because you're talking about revisions, is it common that you're getting a drawing um, for, let's call it V1.0, and by the time you're giving the customer thousands of these, you're on version 5.0? Yeah, absolutely. There, there really are. You, you just go through so many iterations uh, to, to uh, settle on the correct uh, control cable assembly because th- th- there's so many different... Um, things that can happen uh, you, you might want to design like for this cable and in testing you realize ah maybe this isn't as strong mm-hmm. or you design it for this type of fitting and it's oh this fitting may be too large and maybe too small it's it really takes uh many iterations to, to get and it if, right i imagine if you took that drawing at face value and didn't question at all just didn't, weren't skeptical about any of it you would produce the cables that are identified in the drawing or produce the assembly part of me that's identified in the drawing handed to them and then they would learn the hard way that it doesn't fit for whatever reason. So your mm-hmm. job, if I'm hearing you correctly, mm-hmm. is to scrutinize this drawing and apply a little bit of skepticism to the design in the drawing. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Re- really, one of my one of my first things is uh, I, I just ask, like, 
hey, how, how are you making it? Like, how is this being installed? How, right. how are you really going to achieve? Because like I had mentioned earlier, um, they may not, they may see it from, from a thousand foot view and they may, sure. may not exactly see it like, oh, maybe I have to route it through this. Maybe I have to route it through that. Um, it really just takes a big collaborative effort. Right. And I mean, there are folks who have likely made a push-pull cables and push-pull control assemblies for their application, whereas you're seeing them hundreds and hundreds of times every year for a variety of different usages. So you have the benefit of being able to spot maybe that that fitting at the end shouldn't be put on there yet because how are you going to put it in your system once it is on? Exactly. So there's all these little things you have to identify. You have to kind of almost see in the drawing the flaws 10 steps later. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Kyle, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. It was a delight, and I look forward to doing more of these with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you liked the video uh, on control cables or you didn't, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. And um, for that matter, we'd love to, for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. You can find us all over social media. And, of course, you can contact us at SavaCable.com. There's really not much we can't do for you, so please do ask your questions about your custom applications, et cetera. Uh, again, thanks so much, Kyle. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you real soon, everybody. Take care.